recording is on and ah. so so please please let me know if you don't see the the slides um okay so today's lecture is about something called entrepreneurial cognition generative learning and creativity for problem solving and also exploratory thinking uh, so basically this is this is the stuff i urge you to use when you write your essay think outside the box and, and and try to push the boundaries and and because i have this evolutionary approach so i will i will go back to human origin and try to give you a, paint a picture about uh, how these abilities came about so uh, let's let's go back in time so there are some known leaps of the human brain and mind, and, and the first one occurred uh, approximately four million years ago uh, when our ancestors started to uh, put animal source food on the plate, basically. And that initiated the brain growth um, towards today's uh, size and function. So fat found in bone marrow and brain. I, I try to avoid the, the second one because it's but bone marrow is, is more, um, it sounds better, seemed to be key for brain growth. Uh, so what happened was that the brain grew from the, the back of the head, the occipital lobe and forward. So uh, the expansion is mainly in, in the front. That's where everything is happening. And it doubled in size from, from 4 million years ago to approximately 2.8 million years ago. So within one, one to one and a half million years, the brain size doubled. And that's a fantastic um, expansion. So 1.8 million years ago, uh, our ancestors had acquired something called spatial and social cognition. It's basically uh, the ability to orientate yourself in the surrounding. So if you, if you go and look uh, to our cousins, the apes, they stay in the same neighborhood their whole life. Whereas what is typical for humans is that we explore. So these creatures, uh, they, they could use uh, their memory uh, to map the environment and then return safely, just like the astronauts in, in the Apollo program. And also social cognition, which meant they had the ability or developed the ability and early development to uh, cooperate with one another. And for, for this uh, exploration, they became runners bipedal runners. So uh, our species, we can, we can run for hours. It's, a, it's natural for humans to run. Think about that. The next leap occurred maybe 1 million to 500,000 years ago with another 25% expansion of the brain. And, the f and this, is, this is seeing the first symbolic expressions. So uh, tattoos, I think, body ornament and, and, and other um, imaging of, of uh, what, uh, what, what they have done and stuff like that. And then the last one came about 200,000 to 60,000 years ago. And that's when we acquired, or they acquired, the executive functions and extended their ability for networking. So 
executive function executive functions and networking are the key factors for uh, entrepreneurial thinking basically uh, so this is basically what happened this is a this is a very uh, a difficult name to pronounce but the the chadensis uh, means that this creature was found or the remains of the creature was found in chad in, in northern africa the picture to the right is us and what you can see is the difference in brain size and in particular that that um, the the part uh, just before the front frontal lobe so to speak has expanded uh, significantly and that that's that is where all the modern thinking takes place uh, so there are one criteria this is very important uh, to explain this this uh, expansion and these are the micronutrients you need to eat so a foundation for entrepreneurial thinking and the ability to explore forward in time is actually our diet and what we need to eat is a bundle of micronutrients which most people don't know the name of and there are like 13 vitamins we need so a several b c some d's e and the k2 which comes in at least two important forms the, the menaquin four and seven i urge you to look these micronutrients up because they are so important for you 50 to 16 minerals uh, the heme iron is very important magnesium zinc and so forth uh, iodine and you, you need this stuff in order to to make your brain work basically and you can look for the details in in the reference I put there choline also very important for brain functioning and the link goes to a five minute uh, youtube video by dr smith and uh, she is she she's a biochemist from yale and she give you the the information in brief uh, so you can understand the reason why here comes very important stuff docosahexanoic and arachidonic fatty acids and eat here georgia e she's a psychiatrist uh, used to work at harvard actually and uh, she points to nutrition as as a key feature uh, for mental health basically and docosahexanoic fatty acids are also the the fatty acids that anthropologists argue is the reason that uh, the brain growth took took a leap three three point six million years ago. And notable, uh, these micronutrients need to be consumed together. So this this concerns decision making uh, when you're buying food, basically. So make sure everything is there, and and you will you will facilitate your inborn capacity for entrepreneurial cognition basically there are some references so what 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 do we get uh, we have a super large brain that consumes 20 percent of all the energy we consume so if i if i eat 2000 calories so 400 of these go straight to the brain to make that operate still it only make out two percent of the body weight so this is a very um, expensive tissue basically and it comes with a cost so throughout history as the as the brain expanded our their guts uh, was reduced to to uh, a third basically uh, because because the the body or the, the human organ can't operate a big brain and a big gut at the same time uh, 
and all that energy goes for to to think forward in time which we talked about recently explorative and disjunctive reasoning i'm going to cover this here today including blending abs ex abstractions into new concepts that is creativity and telling right from wrong so these are four qualities that that is super crucial for entrepreneurial thinking and look at the last one i mean you can come up with super great ideas but you need to understand that that to tell right from wrong so robbing a bank if you're successful will give you a lot of money but for hundreds of reasons you should avoid doing that and uh, with metacognitive sensitivity you can understand that so uh, if you come up with the idea to um, combine a telephone and a camera think 40 years ago it won't hurt anyone it's, it was probably considered a bit crazy but now we all have one in the pocket so very simple simple examples uh, that you can you can use so thinking forward at forward in time consider many options blend abstractions and understand what you can do and what you shouldn't do uh, so uh, this is about the executive functions. The executive functions is sort of what makes us so different from other, other animals. And this is a rather complex uh, concept. Uh, so if you Google it, you, you could find a variety of uh, references uh, giving different descriptions about this phenomenon so uh, remember i can't give you the exact definition here but i can give you a hint about what what is what it it is all about and then you can explore further into this uh, concept to improve your own understanding about it so in 1998 uh, welsh and pennington said that the executive functions is the ability to maintain an appropriate problem solving set for the attainment of a future goal. So here we go. Uh, this is basically about the prospection uh, I covered last week, the ability to form a, a, a wanted future and to operate a number of um strategies that will fit uh, that problem solving situation basically so if you for example uh, it's summer you're going on vacation and you decide to go to the beach so you understand that you take your swimwear some sunscreen something to eat maybe some water and uh, then head for the beach if you pack your skis instead and truly believe that this is a good good way to go about when you go go to to the beach something in your mind is not functioning so that is your inability to uh, the skis if you pack the skis for 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 the beach that's your inability to maintain the appropriate problem solving set for the attainment of a future goal so the strategies that you apply uh, should resonate with the target basically so if you go into the moon you need a spacesuit you need a rocket and stuff like that and if you do other stuff it has to 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 fit basically uh, Pennington again a bit earlier um, uh, and Ozonov claim it's a domain distinct from other 
cognitive functions as sensation, perception, language, working memory, and long-term memory. And this is very complex, but if, if we try to remember that, that uh, the mind is about memory, uh, perception, and perspection, you can see that sensation and perception is basically about the present, whereas the executive functions seem to be about the future, that is prospection. So you can, you can logically discriminate a sensation and perception from the executive function. And language, I can understand, language is a very complex implicit function. You never plan when, when, you, when you talk. Talk is automatic, especially in a social situation. And that is demonstrated by the fact that you can interrupt your discussion partner because hearing maybe 70% of what he or she says will provide you with, with enough information to understand how the whole thing will end. Uh, that's a bit rude, of course, but, but um, it's, it's how you can do go about. Working memory, it's a different matter because depending on who you ask, working memory is either included in the executive functions or excluded. So working memory is the very small um, uh, memory function we have so we can store telephone numbers, brief recipes that we use often. I mean, if you're, if, you're, if you're like me, making your own pasta, you know that it's like two eggs, two egg yolks, four deciliters of durum wheat flour, uh, some salt, some water, and some oil. That is the kind of information you can, you can uh, keep in your working memory. And long-term memory is the same thing because it's memory and it's not prospection. So I suggest that executive functions is very much about prospection. So this is how uh, Diamond, I will put another D there um, later on. Executive functions make possible mentally playing with ideas taking the time to think before acting, meeting novel unanticipated challenges, resisting temptation, temptations and staying focused. So if you elaborate on, on these uh, descriptions, I think you can see that they're all about the future. So when you make, when you make, uh, when you play with ideas, it's not about uh, a historical count because you can't change history. So every time you, you play with ideas, it's for the future. Uh, taking time before acting, it's very similar. You're about to make a decision, but you stop and you elaborate various scenarios, it's also forward in time. Meeting novel and unanticipated challenges. Uh, th this could be a Kennedy moment when Kennedy uh, addressed uh, the moon statement to the American people. Many of them was probably very surprised when they heard it the first time. And, and that some of them resisted. Uh, Many actually, but, but some did not and thought it was a great idea. Resisting temptation is another story because that is about uh, temperament. So if, if, you, if you come home to your friends and they, and they leave you alone in the kitchen with a plate of cookies, some people take a cookie, some people don't. So those who don't, they have the ability to resist temptation. Very simplified. 
Also stay, staying focused is one of these characters that you, you're doing something and you have the ability to stay in that process basically for a, for a long period of time. And, and you, need to, you need to practice that, uh, all of it actually, because it doesn't come automatically. It is there, but you, it needs to unpack. So if you want to be good at, at uh, playing with ideas, you need to do it on, on uh, often, maybe on an everyday basis. So here we go. This is the first known result of uh, entrepreneurial cognition or creativity or whatever you would call it. And uh, this is the result of someone playing with the idea to put a lion's head on a human body. That's the interpretation by people who are specialized in, in this kind of archaeology. So this is a lion man, lion man, uh, and was found in Germany 1939. But because of the uh, Second World War, they had to, you know, put everything back in the pit. And they returned, I think, almost 10 years later, dug it all up again, found fragments, and spent many years to piece them together to this figurine. It's 30 centimeters long. Uh, and it's said to uh, resemble a lion's head on a human body. You can, you can think about um, the Sphinx in Egypt. There you have a lion's body with a human's head. There are lots of discussions if, if the original head uh, was something else. But for the past two or 3,000 years, it's been a human head on a lion's body. So this is also a, um, it's a similar example how you, how you take animal and human parts and piece them together in an unrelated manner because they don't, they don't fit together. And what you see, this is the same technique as, as uh, the, the mobile phone companies use um, to, uh, to produce smartphones. Because originally a big camera and a big telephone no one ever thought that those could be pieced together or merged or melted together to a single product. I don't know if you see this, but I mean, we, we now take them for granted. Uh, this is, and, and you can find very cheap ones who have, who have everything. I mean, this one has a flashlight, a calendar, you know, all the stuff. You also have it. And we take it for granted. But originally, these were big items. I mean, a, a telephone originally was standing on the table or on the wall. And a camera, if you wanted good picture, was a very big, expensive thing. A calendar could be this size, a flashlight, rather big. And now we, they squeezed everything into this very thin piece. And it's, it's basically the same technique as it was used to produce the Lion Man. I think it's an astonishing uh, feat. Um, yeah, uh, a couple of thousand years later, or maybe 20,000 uh, years later, um, this was constructed. This is Gubekli Tepe. Uh, it's in Turkey to the border of Syria. And the stones are, I think it, they are five to six meters high. And as you can see, they are, the ornaments are relief. And there are, anima the, the stone to the left has a lizard, I think.
before this was found, most scientists thought that the pyramids of Egypt was the first manifestation of human in uh, in what do you say creativity or modern thinking or in in uh, inge ingenuity and stuff like that. So the pyramids are said to be produced about 4,000 years ago. Gubekli Tepe moved that timeline uh, another six or more, uh, 8,000 years back in time. So this is, this is prior to, this happened during the end of the Ice Age. So before modern era. And um, it coincided with the last flood, actually. So this is this is a very very uh, special thing, and you can you can wonder how how did hunters and gatherers suddenly start to to erect these enormous uh, megaliths? I think they weighed about six thousand kilograms or six tons. And all of them are ornaments and, and beautiful, very easy to, to see what kind of animals they depicted. How was that possible? I mean, they, they, had, they had a mental functioning, but they, maybe they needed something more. And, and here we go to my favorite pictures. This is the, what, what is considered the start of the Renaissance. Um, the cupola on the Cathedral of Florence, actually, and it measures 42 meters across. And because I, I, I like creativity, I, I went there, actually. I brought my family and took them to the top of the roof so I could see where the Renaissance originated. But it's it, during the 1300th century, I mean, you can, you can see that the church is so much bigger than, than all the other buildings. So this must have been like uh, the Apollo program in the US during the 1960s. I mean, it, it was an astonishing feat. And remember also that the church had no roof for 20 years because they couldn't find anyone who knew how to erect this self-supporting cupola. And of course, Filippo Brunelleschi or Brunelleschi didn't know how to erect a self-supporting cupola before he did it. He must have used the executive functions to simulate some possible models in his mind. And I was there 2014, and at that time, they had not yet um, understood how he did it, actually. Which is kind of strange, because it's 600 years ago. So anyway, this was an eye-opener for people. And what happened also was that during this time, Florence was at that time the, the center of the known world. So this is basically the capital of Europe. Uh, they started to use calculus. And I have kids who, who starts to use calculus at like five or six years of age. But before uh, the start of the Renaissance, calculus was not used the way we use it today. It was not the typical way of, of, uh, of measuring stuff or, or uh, people just trade it using other measures. So now we take a big leap. We don't have much time. And I don't know uh, how much you like airplanes, but this is probably one of the greatest 
innovations of all time. If you take, take into account when it was built, how long it took to build it, uh, what it could do actually, you know, all the factors. So uh, this, is the, it, this is a CIA uh, spy plane. But it sounds so bad, so it's called uh, reconnaissance surveillance. Uh, it's also known as the, the SR-71 or the Blackbird because of the color. Uh, so in post Second World War, uh, there were some tensions in the world be be between the democratic part of the world and the Soviet Union. And the Americans, they wanted to know if uh, the Soviets had the ability to transport a nuclear bomb and uh, drop it somewhere in the United States. So they famously built the U-2, which is still op in operation. And they flew over the Soviet Union and taking pictures and then uh, the, the plane was shut down, one of them, and then they came up with this one. And the CIA, they said, it has to do Mach 3, which is very, very fast. And it has, must have the ability to reach 90,000 feet, which is about 30,000 kilometers. So if you go on a normal, if you take, if you take a plane, uh, somewhere they reach, I think, 10,000 kilometers. So this is three times as high. And the trick was that because of the speed, um, they had to invent everything, the engines, the cover. This is the first, first stealth plane. They also needed titanium because, because, uh, because of the speed, uh, the plane became really hot and they needed titanium. And the main supplier was the Soviet Union, the target for this plane. So CIA set up uh, fake ent enterprises in Europe to buy large amount of titanium from the Soviet Union. And they did that very successfully. So they could build this plane uh, just a few years uh, and uh, start operating across the world. It has no weapons. It just in the front, it has a super big camera, basically. So it, it could, it's not operative anymore, but it, it could go anywhere and take photos of small, small, uh, very detailed photos. So what is this all about? Uh, I work at the university and our management, they called for entrepreneurship, they call for creativity, they call for innovation, they ask us to think outside of the box. Um, which is obviously something we all can do, it's an inborn capacity. But let's take a look at the definitions here. So when we talk about entrepreneurial, I talk about entrepreneurial cognition, not entrepreneurship, but entrepreneurial cognition as the way you think when you think outside of the box, so to speak. So it's normal knowledge structures. That means the more you know, the better. So going to school, stuff your brain with knowledge about everything, it's a very good, good thing to do. And it's the knowledge that you use for assessment, judgment, or decision-making. Your ability to, so if you, for example, you get an opportunity to, to buy something or to go into a venture or you're being offered uh, an interesting job, uh, it's that kind of knowledge you use uh, to evaluate situations. And you know, it's all about thinking forward in time. It's about use simplifying mental models to piece together previously unconnected information that helps them to identify and invent new products and services. 
So entrepreneurial cognition is basically what happened when the first person came up with the idea to add a camera to a telephone. They used entrepreneurial cognition. And because it's normal knowledge structures, so we remember this famous picture, the mind is what the brain does. It's Stephen Pinker at Harvard, it's not me, but I think it says it all. So as you can see in, I think you say purple, uh, you have declarative cognition above the blue line and there resides executive function functions and working memory. Now remember some say that working memory is part of the executive functions, but I put them, I put them apart. So maybe you use working memory when you think forward in time or, or anything, but it's not the same thing maybe. Below the blue line, you have all the other stuff. Uh, so the green one is the engine, the driver of behavior. So what you use, uh, your cognition to trigger the driver of behavior, which explains all kinds of behavior. If you get up from bed in the morning, you dance, you walk, you talk, all the procedural memories. And they are, they are uh, facilitated or inhibited by emotions. And those are the within the red line. As, as you can see that emotions make out, uh, it's like a part of motivation. So in neuropsychology, we talk about primes. So that those are motivations, motivation and emotions. And emotions are, uh, you, you can't control them. So, um, but you can hide them. So that's when you show disgust. Uh, you get ang angry, you become sad, you feel fear. It can also be surprise. And that's, an, that's a neutral uh, emotion. You can feel happiness and you can experience uh, curiosity, for example, to explore. So you can say that curiosity triggers uh, exploratory thinking. So then curiosity, becomes motivation to explore. And I think this is, this is, this is uh, an image I produced over the years. Uh, it's not in a text from any textbook. It's just uh, from the information I got from my previous supervisor when I did my undergraduate studies in psychology and psychophysiology. And I thought, Producing this picture uh, will, will make a very easy to understand illustration about the mind. So you can think about this when you think about entrepreneurial cognition. So, but it all lands to, uh, we, we go back to prospection. So, uh, um, and that is, uh, one of the three part structures of the mind. So it's not memory, it's not perception, it's thinking forward in time. Let's see what I wrote here. Uh, <clears throat> so the mind uh, is either uh, representations of the past, which is called memories, but then you have the experience of the present. So what, what, what when you listen to me actually, it's uh, perception at work. When you listen to me and think about the essay, that's prospection. Now what the brain does is it, it combines incoming information and stuff like that and it elaborates all that in, in, uh, in relation to memory and perception. And that's why it's so hard, uh, for example, uh, to be accurate when people ask you to make a decision forward in time. Uh, 
if you, if you're gonna go shopping for food, will you go? Will you buy organic, or will you go for price? Most people say they go organic, and when they go and buy the food that they buy, they go for price. And that that leads us to the next of the three. So we had a, a entrepreneurial cognition, and then we had generative learning. So generative learning, it's it is like entrepreneurial cognition, but often mentioned in the field of organizational development, and I think also in pedagogics, actually. Not so often in psychology. So Peter Senge, he's a famous, I think he's in, I think he's in learning, actually, pedagogics at MIT. He's very senior now. And in, in 1980s and early 1990s, he wrote a famous book called The Fifth discipline. He also wrote an article, and I choose the article. So generative learning is about creating. So if you now remember what, what prospection and entrepreneurial cognition was all about, generative learning resembled those, don't they? And also saying it says that generative learning as opposed to adaptive learning, which is about coping. And I can give you a very famous example, uh, the Pythagorean uh, axiom or algorithm, which is like you, you have this, you have a square and you want to calculate the diagonal. And there's a famous formula that goes h equals the square root of the sums of um, a, the to the power of two plus b to the power of two. When, when he came up with that, that was generative learning, basically, or entrepreneurial thinking. When we learn it, it's adaptive learning. So if you have your, uh, you have your favorite music, uh, like I, I listened to music from the early 1970s, if, if, if I would try to mimic that, try, try to play guitar, for example, like one of my guitar heroes, that would be adaptive learning. But when they created the song, it was about generative learning, if you can grasp the difference. So this is what uh, Dr. Senge is writing. So leadership in a learning organization starts with the principle of creative tension. Creative tension comes from seeing clearly where we want, uh, where we want to be, our vision, and telling the truth about where we are, our current reality. The gap between the two generates a natural tension. So seeing clearly what we want to be is prospection. It's intentional prospection, a goal of the future. And then we have the current reality. And this is basically his illustration from, from the article. So you can see that I think what he's trying to say that uh, the wider the gap, the greater the creative tension. And that's basically how I see it too. So I think early on, I gave you an example about you're lying on the couch, you're watching X on the beach, and you have a big bowl of candy on your stomach. And then you come up with a super smart idea. Well, I have the inborn capacity for running. So why, I, why don't I go for a run? I mean, that's good for me. So should I, I never, I haven't done it in, or never done it, maybe. Should I go for 10 kilometers or should I go for one kilometer? Most people will say uh, that you will go for one kilometer, and I, I say go for 10 kilometer because it's more challenging. And you may think that, oh no, you're gonna hurt yourself. I don't think so, because if you go for 10 kilometer, you will not run 10 kilometers. You will go, you will run 300 meters, then walk for three kilometers, then you run 300 meters, you walk three, kilometers and so on. But your memory about it was that you ran. But also the prospect is very challenging. So it, would, it will trigger 
all that dopamine you need to get off the couch and put aside the bowl of candy, which is bad for you from a nutritional point of view. So, but anyway, don't we recognize Peter Senger's uh, principle for creative tension? I mean, it's called Dunke, as I mentioned before. The, the famous German uh, gestalt psychologist, we would call him a social psychologist today. Uh, Dunke said that you have a current state, you formulate an intentional target, a goal, then you have a problem as the difference between the current state and the goal. And there you go, if you listen to Peter saying, uh, be honest about your, your current state. And when you set your goal, try to make it a bit challenged. And now you go about, you use a number of strategies to attain that target. And that could be current state on the couch, run 10 kilometers basically, be in the forest, that's the best thing to do. It could be some, put a man on the moon. It could be combining a telephone with a camera, building a spy plane. Not many people do that anymore, and so on. So Senge and Dunker's model for, for um, uh, problem solving slash creative tension works, could be, could be used in any situation. Your home, you want to go to the beach. Your home, you want to go to Prisma to buy some food. Your home in Helsinki, you want to go to Stockholm. You want to go to the Alps and go skiing. You want to go to the Central Park to do some uh, biking. Or you, you just want to go for a walk. So you, you can apply these models on anything, basically. So we do some rehearsal with, with prospection. So we have prediction. Prospection was prediction, like weather and climate forecasting. Uh, often very unreliable, actually even though we try to believe in them. But mo most of these prediction models are very, very unreliable. Intention, goal setting, simulation like creativity now and entrepreneurial cognition and generative learning. Planning, planning is the strategies uh, in Dunker's model. When you, when you try to figure out how to move from the current state to the goal state. And we focused on intention and simulation on the last um, uh, lecture. And I think we stay there. Aha, uh, uh -huh. why did I put there, this one here? Yeah, because the, cent the central thing with prospection is that it's all about whether, whether you do a, a prediction model of the weather or you simulate your thinking, the bottom line is that it's all about setting a goal and reaching it. So everything goes back to Carl Dunke or Peter Sengen modeling. And the reason it has, it should be challenging and very symbolic is that when you are challenged, that will release dopamine in your system. And the experience of dopamine, as I mentioned before, is called motivation. So motivation is basically a psychological concept to describe a, a neurophysiological phenomenon. But you know, uh, dopamine is also the, the driver for going to the refrigerator and eat stuff you shouldn't eat or go and buy candy. So dopamine, Will, will create motivation in any direction. So that's why you use goal setting to inhibit bad stuff and to encourage good stuff.
So you use executive function to suppress the bad stuff and to encourage the good stuff. The motivation explained, as I said, performance, learning, explorative thinking, entrepreneurial cognition, or creativity for problem solving. So I think in lecture two about leadership, I put my thesis in there. I have it all there. It's very simplified. My assistant supervisors said uh, that it's easy to read my thesis, which is basically a critique against it. But you can find <coughs> very simplified how, how this is, um, how, how these concepts are associated. Uh, so we went for performance and uh, performance to trigger learning and explorative thinking and all that. So try to remember the John F. Kennedy statement. He used goal, a goal statement about something that sounded completely impossible. So building an an air shuttle to go to uh, to the moon, which, which is basically another planet. It's it's something far away from Earth, basically. And what's triggered what the sim simulation capacity we call creativity. Many people, many researchers uh, concurred to that, and that was the ability that created the um, the Lion Man. 40,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago, that's fantastic. So in create, creativity from a cognitive archeological perspective, um, says something like this. The individual who conceived and executed the figurine was clearly capable of abstract thinking. A Levenmensch or lion man is not a creature of this earth. It melds the cognitively distinct categories of a lion and person into a single abstract entity. So there you go, it's the same technique as when you take a camera and a phone. This melding must initially have been the result of an effortful conjunction of information in, in active attention. That means thinking about it and such effortful Conjunction is the province of modern executive functions and working memory. So they talk about working memory and executive function in conjunction. So in conclusion, entrepreneurial cognition is using, using mental models to piece together previous, previously unconnected information Generative learning, on the other hand, is creativity by establishing creative tension. Creativity is melding or combining non-related abstractions into new distinct categories. And they all resonate with, with, simula with pros prospective simulation, that is elaborating scenarios forward in time. So it seems that this ability that we that that leaders of the university or any corporation business is an inborn capacity that that emerged at least forty thousand years ago, and most likely sixty to ninety thousand years ago. And why we we had we had a big brain much longer than that. But the key is that we talk to each other, or they did. They started to communicate and do networking. And networking is uh, talking to people who hold a different uh, point of view is the key. So only talking to people who use the same language and have the same attitude is not very successful. And I spoke to some business people in, in Helsinki a week ago, and they said that entrepreneurship in Finland is manifested in the border, just, just where the Swedish speaking language and the Finnish speaking language, where they meet, where they melt together. So people who, when, when people communicate, 
they know that the other person is using a different language. So when you go to cultures when they only use one language, entrepreneurial thinking is not manifested in the same way. So multilinguality, ling, multilanguage is one important aspect of that. And there's a link to a proceeding I wrote with a colleague in Sweden, uh, Bengt Schöpping-Olsson. And what we tried to do is we, there's a definition of creativity there. That's why I used it. But we, we, we also tried to, uh, tried to, to elaborate on how uh, um, aesthetic expressions and body movements and stuff like that, how that influenced that ability. It's brief. So how do we facilitate entrepreneurial cognitions, generative learning and creativity for problem solving? So we know that multi-language multi is, uh, is, is good. Uh, so hook up with people from, from a different culture, try to exchange ideas. We do, because I live in a research village, we, we see each other and experience each other's food culture. And that's interesting. It seems that when, when you're open-minded, you want to experience other people's food culture. So the sad story is then that people ask for the Swedish food culture, which is, uh, I don't know if we have one. We eat meatballs from Turkey and uh, pizza from Italy, very common. But probably something, something else. Leadership style matters. Think Kennedy. So leaders who use goal setting in combination with decentralization to encourage networking, they seem to trigger social creativity. That was my research approach. So you can find information about that in my thesis, basically. And this is also um, moderated by social culture setup. So you have to look a bit about culture because there's, there's a variation that could be explained by culture. Work climate for creativity matters. Uh, and we went through that on the third lecture, I think, um, with culture and climate. And this is very complex because uh, culture has a 10 dimensional uh, latent structures, which goes like people want challenge, they want support for idea generation, they want justice. We all want this is the stuff we all want. Um, we want time to debate and play, and we try to avoid conflict, but the conflict in this case is. Um, when you don't accept viewpoint diversity, basically. So debate is good, conflict, that is suppressing debate. And you have to go back and, and, and learn about which these dimension was, because there are lots of them. And then we have the other one with job satisfaction from Edwin Locke from 1976, I think it was. So you bring them together and you have 15 dimensions. But some of them uh, are more important than others. So challenge and, and clear uh, goal setting is key. These are the two main things you need to think about. So that, that resembles uh, my leadership model as I, as I present. Walking in nature, this is, this is, it sounds, it sounds like, uh-huh, mm -hmm. So Oketso and Schwartz in, in 2014 did a very, very elegant uh, research about this. So they, they asked people to, uh, I think sit still was one option, doing nothing. A second option was uh, walking on a treadmill. So they have walking. And the third one was walking in a suburban 
area, you had lots of concrete buildings, not very aesthetic. And the fourth one was uh, walking together in nature. So all of them, I think on the treadmill, I can't remember if they were alone, but walking in the suburb, suburb you did it with someone. So uh, you have a, a social effect here. Turns out, I mean, this is not rocket science. Every, everyone understands that. But being in nature together with someone and talking uh, makes you more open-minded. So when you then do a creativity test, you come up with more ideas when you're in nature. So um, aesthetics matters. So going on the treadmill, I mean, some people like that but it's not good for creativity. And sitting still behind a screen, like we do now, it's, it's not good either. Running, I did a test on running, turns out not that good actually. Could be that, could be that when you're running, you're too focused. When you're walking, you're more relaxed. And uh, walking, in nature, it's built on something called the attention restoration theory. I thought I put it there, but I didn't. Uh, by Kaplan and Kaplan, it was published in 2000, uh, no, 1989. And it basically, what, what they suggest is that, that uh, you improve your, your ability for attention when you're in, na in, in nature. And that means basically you improve your well being. So if you feel down for some reason, and you consider what should I do to be more harmonious, take a walk in the forest. Because it's like you smell the trees, you hear the birds, you feel the ground, and you can touch stuff also with your hand, which is very important actually. So stones and wet stuff and you know mud and stuff like that is basically good for you for you for your mind and that that all that can improve creativity and entrepreneurial cognition this is from this is from me basically activate sigmatic major sigmatic major is a muscle if you see me it's situated here at the corner of my mouth and originates from this bone here. So when you activate it, you elevate the corners of your mouth. And sometimes that, that is a smile. But what happens is that when you activate the muscle, an uh, electric chemical signals goes to the limbic system and uh, saying you experience comfort that so it's good it could be harmony you like it so if you for example um, let's say i'm a bit late with uh, handing out um, um, the correct uh, when, when i have read your thesis is sorry essays and you're eager to know because you're in a hurry so you plan to meet with me which is kind of difficult now with the COVID-19. But anyway, we, we play with our minds here. If you walk in the corridor and you see me, I see you, and I, I understand this is a student who, want, who wants information about his or her uh, essay. <coughs> so I become a bit stressed. What you can do, you can elevate the corners of your mouth. You send me a signal, I come in peace. I become relaxed and what you, we have a better conversation and then you can, when, when you reach my personal space, you can, you can give all the, the hard questions. You can fool me with that. So basically, activate, activated Sigomotic mind is a very good tool. This, this is what people do uh, when they want to connect, if you understand what I mean. So if you go out, if you've been dancing with someone you never met before, you smile to each other. And a few years later, you have bought a house together. And nobody knows how that, that happened. Uh, dancing, actually. 
So my colleague Bengt and I, we, we've been doing dancing for many years in, in, a, uh, in relation to creativity. And we're influenced by this guy, Peter Lovett. You can find him on YouTube. Um, he can show you all the details. But what, what is basically the thing is that when you dance, something happens with your emotions, whether you're on or off the beat, doesn't matter, but it should be your favorite music. And when you then do a creativity test, you come up with more ideas. And we show that you three minutes will do to make that change. It's a very good thing. Uh, so there you have five interventions that you can use to facilitate or enhance your um, what do you call it, entrepreneurial cognition, generative learning, or creativity for problem solving ability? What you should understand that this this is a this is a capacity that originated through evolution, because our ancestors once, for a very long time ago, started to eat animal sourced food and especially fat from bone marrow, and because of that, they got. Uh, like 30 micronutrients, which we still need to, to have a functioning mind. And key, key to that are a combination of heme iron, iodine, zinc, and uh, uh, DHA, docosahexanoic fatty acid. It took me a month to learn how to pronounce that. This is super important for brain health and also for a functioning mind. Uh, and when you have that, so if you, if, if you basically don't have the ability to think forward in time, you're not in harmony. You're not, you're not mindful because mindfulness is, <clears throat> is basically this ability. We have that in the other paper uh, from 2018 in a, in a previous picture. So when you're mindful, you're in harmony, but your mind is elaborating scenarios forward in time. So anytime you automatically start to think about the future, you're in harmony. If you're not, and you want to be there, you can ask your boss to be, improve his or hers ability, often very hard. Uh, so then that will influence the work climate. What you can do yourself, you can, besides eating very good food, you can walk in nature, you can activate, you can smile to other people. They will smile back actually because there's a forward effect. You can dance. So for example, this morning, I did disco dancing with my kids. And we've been doing that for many years. And for them, they, 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 I think they believe that all people do that. But maybe it's only us. But the disco dancing makes them be become more harmonious. Uh, and then, uh, if you want, many people ask for a list of stuff, a long list of stuff. <clears throat> and uh, this is what leaders should think leaders should think about and this is clarence kelly johnson so he is the guy who basically led the design work on the sr-71 blackbird spy plane that he built for cia and this is a 14 point list so i i i go into it in brief it's very small letters also And this is about communication. I, I, I might say, must say that I, I don't agree with everything, but, and I think I don't read it because it's a bit complicated. Um, but as you can see, what he thinks, I think I, uh, what, what I got from it was that if you, if you, if you hand out uh, a task, that person should be in full control. And also, because this was very, very secret stuff, 
he worked with small groups that that uh, reported straight to the manager in an open organization you shift that a little things that are secret has to be secret and then you learn from kelly johnson but otherwise you need to network so um I, for example, had a conversation with a, uh, a woman from Toronto who followed me on Twitter for some reason. She was a professor of medicine. So I sent her an email and asked for a Zoom. And we had one and a half hour conversation about medicine and anthropology and food and stuff like that. So for me, that was a, a learning experience. Uh, and maybe she she had the same same feeling. but. And I've done that on a numerous occasion with people around the world. I ask for a conversation. So in a few weeks, I will speak to a, a famous anthropologist. She's somewhere in the US or in Africa, I don't know, really. But we decided to do that. And I'm also going to talk with a, with, a, with a psychologist, colleague psychologist, who is in California. I don't know these people. But I think they seem to be smart, so I network with them. So I have a conversation and see if I can learn anything. So that's a good thing. So here you go. Uh, I think Kelly Johnson had, had uh, control of every detail. You can go through that list and see if you can, uh, if there's something you think is important uh, for, for your way of thinking. Uh, now, what was special with Clarence Kelly Johnson? This is, this is interesting. His parents emigrated from Sweden, from south of Sweden, from, from Malmö, actually. And they lived a very poor life. I think it was in Wisconsin or something. So he grew up on a poor condition. But as you can understand, they spoke Swedish at home. But he later worked for the American CIA. So somewhere along the line as he was in a foreign country he integrated by learning the local language which in this case was english so if you go for finland for example you have two official language languages you can speak swedish or finnish but he was bilingual like many people in finland or like many people in belgium or canada and most of India, actually, many people in India, I heard, speak uh, four languages. So he was probably very open minded about things. Because of that bilingual function, he was also formally educated uh, in aerodynamics. To build airplanes, but very few people had the ability to construct uh, SR-71. Uh, it's a, it's an interest, and he also did the U two. So uh, I think by that I I uh, I'm done basically. So uh, I ask you if you have any questions. Anyone who dares to drop me a question? Hello? One each, please. Could we do that? Okay, I, I stop recording here.